Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those of you who are based in uh, Middle East as well as in Europe. Uh, my name is Mushir Ahmed. I'm the founder of FinStep Asia and co-founder of the Virtual FinTech Fair, which is hosting the AI and Big Data in FinTech Forum today. Uh, today, we are going to be joined by some real experts in the space of looking at how AI and Big Data has impacted uh, talent, talent acquisition, as well as talent development. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'll ask my panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves, starting off with Komal. Hi, everyone. I'm Komal, and uh, I um, have been involved in a number of uh, uh, startups. Uh, right now, I'm leading the customer success for Core.ai, uh, which is a conversational AI platform. Thank you, Komal. Koi? Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, Moshe. That's a real pleasure to be with you, you know, across the world here. I'm uh, calling from London here, yeah? and uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, the Center for Finance, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I've had the chance you know, to be in different worlds, from the world of banking, where I used to be a managing director at Citi, to technology. So I used to run a tech company before, and uh, also academia, where I was an associate fellow at Oxford State Business School. And now at CFT, our objective is education at scale, making sure that people in financial services have the right skills for a world of finance today, which is hugely driven by uh, digital and technology. And uh, on the AI side, I was co-program director of the largest course for artificial intelligence in finance. We so spent a lot of time looking at the impact of AI on financial services. Great, thank you. Chapman? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm Chapman from Inwesco, and I'm based in Hong Kong. Currently, I look after the APEC investment technology, and my team is delivering the technology and data solutions to the APEC investment centers for the multiple asset classes. Thank you. Thank you, Chapman. And uh, we are awaiting our fourth uh, panelist, who is Abhinav Agarwal, uh, founder of uh, Fluid.ai. He's, he's delayed a little bit, but we will dive into the panel because, you know, panels don't wait for anyone. Um, I want to start off with talking to the panelists a lot about how AI as a technology has quite often been touted for being responsible, you know, for millions of job losses. We've had a variety of large institutions, including big banks, who have come out with reports in the last five years, which said that, you know, by 2020, 2025, we're going to see tens of millions of jobs lost lost to AI and machine learning and, and you know, robotics. However, that hasn't quite happened. Even when you take COVID into picture, uh, what are your views? Why hasn't there been such a significant impact on the job market just yet, right? Uh, why don't we start with you, Komal? Yeah, uh, I mean, AI uh, has, um, AI has created a new demand for a new kind of skill set. And I think uh, history, it, based on the history, technology is always a net job creator, right? So there has been a decline in certain skill sets, which were repetitive tasks. But at the same time, there has been an increased demand in certain skill sets, which require more kind of uh, cognitive skills, creative thinking, etc. cetera. And, uh, there, and there has been a direct as well as an indirect impact on the job market, uh, especially related to AI, where they, there is a more net job creation with the skills that are needed to analyze complex data, et cetera. So I believe that on an average scale, uh, the demand of uh, uh, AI skill set has more than offset the you know job losses uh, around the repetitive tasks. Sorry, uh, Chapman, what's your view on this? How is How are you looking at personally and also from an investor perspective? Well, I think it really depends on the uh, industry and the roles, honestly. And for example, uh, from the financial uh, industry, um, the AI or the machine learning actually is not something to um, eliminate the jobs uh, in the industry. And on the other hand, actually, it's something to transform um, the workforce um, to focus more on the value at the surface. And the machine actually is going to um, improve the scalability of the workforce. Uh, for example, um, the uh, algorithm trading uh, is quite popular nowadays, so especially in the equities trading. And um, there are more and more and um, trading balls or something like the auto trader or machine trader, something they um, introduced a few years ago. 
However, we can see um, it turns to a new um, culture. It's a machine and human have to work together instead of uh, to um, eliminate the jobs. And on the other hand, with the assistance for this kind of the um, algorithm trading or trading automation, actually it can uh, increase or decrease the um, trading capacity or bandwidth to the trading desk, um, especially when we have a, a huge number of orders uh, on the rebalance day, uh, we can distribute the work uh, between human and machine. So it is something we can observe uh, in this industry. Somehow it is a, a better utilization for, the, uh, for both human and machine resources. Thank you. Uh, Hui, you have a very broad you know, view, viewpoint in terms of what you're seeing, both working with institutions as well as talent as well. But so why why hasn't um, the AI, uh, you know, the impact of AI been so severe? Is it down to the maturity of the technology or was it the case of uh, uh, banks and others uh, overestimating as usual? <laughs> so I think it's, a, it's an important and very difficult question because I guess, no, uh, when I worked you know, on the AI program, that's really the first question that we're, that we're asking ourselves and people are interested in, which is, is it going to lead to more jobs or fewer jobs? Uh, and I think you know, in general, you know, as Komal said, uh, what we've seen is that usually you know, people, we have adapted and usually you know, technology has been better. Uh, so led you know, to more jobs, not necessarily the same jobs, but more jobs. Uh, for AI, is it going to be the same? I don't know. The first, so the first thing in terms of you know, why haven't we seen you know, millions of jobs you not know, disappear? The reality is that if we look at, you know, for example, here we're talking about banks, if we look at the large banks, for example, those processes are very, very long processes. Implementation of AI in a bank, it won't happen overnight. You know, as you know from working in large organizations, it will take years or you know, sometimes you know, decades you know, for this kind of transformation. So it takes a long, long, long time. And of course, you know, a bank you know, won't overnight replace you know, a thousand people with an AI and you know, they won't you know, let you know, a thousand people go. So again, you know, those are very, very long processes. Now, however, in terms of a big picture, I think what we have to be very wary about is not just you no know, jobs being lost in banks, is for example, who will provide financial services and what is the structure of those organizations? Uh, and I'll take a very simple example. Um, I don't know if you, you know what is the largest challenger bank in the world. Uh, from the UK, you know, we would say, you know, Revolut or, you know, Starling, etc. But actually, the ch largest challenger bank in the world is a new bank in Brazil, 40 million clients, uh, 40 million clients and less than 4,000 employees. If we take a similar bank, uh, let's say, you no know, ING, ING, 40 million clients, 40 million clients, but I think around like 60,000 employees. So to uh, service the same number of customers, you have a ratio of 1 to 10, 1 to 15. And because, of course, they're hugely automated, you know, hugely digital. And this is more, I think, you know, the kind of issues we need to think of, which is that if in the future financial services as a whole, so not necessarily of you know, banks are losing jobs, so as a whole can be done with you not know, 10 times, 15 times fewer people, then here definitely you know, there's a question of, of losing jobs. But this is a long process, of course, because new bank won't take you know, all the customers of uh, you know, traditional banks, not overnight, but this is not the, I think the big macro question that we should be asking ourselves. Thank you, Hui. and I think it, it is a broader question that we will see evolve uh, over time. Uh, coming to Abhinav, uh, Abhinav, welcome, uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, it would be good to start off with a brief introduction about yourself and what Fluid.ai uh, uh, does and uh, getting your response on why we haven't seen a significant job loss in the market because of AI and what are we expecting in the coming days? Yeah. Absolutely, thanks Mashir. So, you know, at Fluid AI, we're a company that does, uh, you know, a lot of interesting work in the North American, European region where we do AI analytics for a lot of global banks and insurers. And we also have our own bots, uh, bot platform that helps customers do, you know, smart interactions on it. Uh, you know, we've been recognized by Forster and Gartner as a top deep learning vendor uh, we've also, you know, worked with a, lo a lot of folks on, on some very interesting stuff. And as a company, we've been recently on the cover of Forbes magazine as well. But, you know, less about me and, you know, you know, Mushir, you asked a great question there. You know, I think, uh, you know, with, with technologies like AI, what we've also seen often happen, and everyone keeps talking about job losses, where when you look down at the market, the exact opposite is happening, right? There's so much there's so much demand for people, right? You, you look at FedEx recently talked about that they, 
missed their last quarter by $500 million because they didn't have enough people to service packages. Uh, you look at, you know, every tech company out there that's saying, okay, we are looking for more data scientists. We don't have enough people. Um, uh, and, and you, you look at, you know, IT in general is hiring in a massive, massive numbers. Uh, so across the industry, we are actually seeing the reverse trend because probably, you know, to highest point, you know, smaller companies are being able to service and really grow the pie, right? Making banking more accessible to a large number of people. So while AI does remove some jobs, it actually incidentally ends up creating, in my opinion, because you're servicing so many more customers, you're, you're increasing the economies and businesses by such larger scales, kind of like what the IT revolution did, you know, back in the 1990s to 2000, right? Business became so much phenomenally bigger for everyone. I think AI is doing that revolution and causing a massive job increment because of that. So it does remove some jobs, but it's adding so many because of the growth that it, it nullifies the effect. Thank you. Um, I want to move on now from talking about what was expected and where we see things to looking at how AI and you know big data in general are uh, transforming some of the industries, right? Uh, can you, you know, I would love, I love uh, to start off with Chapman to ask about what are the key automation cases you see in the industry, uh, as well as, you know, how has the impact of the workforce? We know that, you know, millennial capital has been looking at investing uh, using AI or, you know, smart algos for over 35 years now, in the mid 80s is when they started, but and that industry has evolved significantly uh, in some markets up to 50% of the Alg uh, of the traders are uh, algos, right? So how are you seeing this evolve for uh, Invesco and uh, in general in the investor management world? Yeah, sure. Uh, for example, maybe uh, I can elaborate a little bit uh, on the trading uh, automation on um, some of the examples that I've seen uh, in the past few years. Actually, it is um, an idea to um, have the AI or the machine learning mechanism to assign um, the orders to an this book uh, with the select um, algo strategies. And from data perspective, actually, um, it's usually to, for example, rely on the um, other size or the average daily volume and the exchange code. These are the common data set uh, to uh, input to the um, machine and then to calculate and to find out the eligible orders that can sample for the automation. And from our observation, uh, I think this um, trading strategy actually is particularly um, useful for some of the portals, for example, like the ETF portals, because uh, for the ETF port is usually uh, we generate lots of order on the web balance days. And uh, with this amount of the order, actually uh, quite lots of order may be uh, quite liquid, liquid. So that's when we can actually just send food this order to the stream um, and to have the trader to do the executions. But on the other hand, for the human trader, actually um, they can focus on the liquidity. They can find the liquidity for those uh, illiquid orders. So that's mean you can see there's a, um, a um, allocation for the work between a machine and human. They will focus on different things and based on their strength. For the human, we'll focus on the more on the search on the liquidity. And for the machine, it will focus more to just do some easy order in a quick, uh, you know, quick rate. So uh, I think it is quite a good um, scenario on, on, on the industry, uh, especially in the trading, how do they uh, how do we leverage the machine? And actually, after a few years of observation, uh, we found that um, the performance for this kind of trading boss actually is usually uh, in the middle of the benchmark or a little, a little bit better. Um, I think it's not difficult to explain because you can um, emerge um, the machine or the algorithm actually is leveraging or relying on the historical data to predict um, the order behavior or to find the liquidity. So that's why uh, I think it's also explain uh, why uh, this kind of the automation is actually is to um, improve the bandwidth for the trading desk and to improve the um, scalability of a firm rather than to uh, eliminate the jobs. Yes, okay, fair enough. I think that's worthwhile in terms of I think scale is going to be an important element. Um, now, uh, Avinav, you, you mentioned about you know your work you're doing with Europe and US with a variety of clients. Uh, what are the kind of use cases that you are providing for your clients and uh, especially on the automation side of things? Absolutely. I think, you know, you know, we, we've seen two levels of automation. One is the higher level automation. So that's, you know, really complex jobs. So Things like, you know, underwriting someone's credit. So, you know, algorithms that can help, you know, underwrite loans or figure out who's going to default. 
So do that entire processing on the fraud side. We work with a lot of insurers and banks in, you know, auto detection fraud or processing fraud, you know, automatically for claims. Uh, so that's on the on the more higher complex side. And, and that's been interesting because, you know, essentially it's a making each person a lot more productive and, and automating their, their role. But uh, at the same time, it's bringing new insights into the into the business and helping them grow. Uh, and then we've seen on the you know on the simpler side, there's been obviously a lot of automation that's come in. So you know, with with things like bots, uh, you know, the simple stuff like you know call center requests getting automated, uh, you know, simple interactions with the customer becoming automated, reminders getting automated. Uh, we've had these AI phone calls that call up a customer, will will tell him, okay, you're passed you on a loan, do you want to restructure a loan? So any kind of conversation that typically would you'd give your call center agent a flow or a flow chart to follow, uh, whether it's on WhatsApp, whether it's on phone, we've seen all of that is now starting to get automated very quickly. Thank you. Um... So, well, I'm going to come to you now in terms of, you know, uh, based on what Core does uh, as well as otherwise uh, with AI and big data reducing the need for uh, human workforce in, in a variety of different applications, uh, will it reduce more need for human workforce or will it enable humans to work on higher value tasks? Which way do you see this going? Especially considering that a majority of the OECD and the developed world is moving towards an aging population, right? So the number of uh, available workforce is reducing. Yeah. No, uh, th this is a really an uh, interesting question because <clears throat> we often uh, see resistance from the workforce when uh, you know there, there's an introduction of AI. But uh, the reality of the fact is that that there's not a, a you know the the workforce themselves are getting upskilled. There is a an increase. You know the AI is actually accelerating the development of new skills, which uh, gives them more time to uh, do higher value tasks. So for example, you know, people who are uh, doing repetitive tasks earlier. So for example, I, I'm going to pick up the example of like call center uh, automation, right? You know, just uh, doing uh, inquiry calls. Now that can be translated into a, a bot and through a, a conversation AI so that the call center uh, uh, agents can actually focus on more value added and critical uh, tasks like troubleshooting uh, uh, issues or you know answering uh, critical customer uh, requests or escalations similarly you know it's not just for enhancing customer experience but also for the employee side right so on, on for uh, it is providing more productivity to employees because we can see that you know earlier whatever tasks were done by employees were spending so much time trying to find out information doing man manual analysis etc now with the advent of this ai skills there is a big shift towards doing more critical and analytical thinking uh, based on the data that has been already processed by ai right so i see that with uh, ai and technology um, the advancement of skills is accelerated and this is how I see the organization should also take their workforce, train them to upskill themselves in uh, these AI skills, because with the increase in productivity, there is an increase in revenue and also there is increase in time and uh, uh, for, for the employees to do more value tasks. So is it me or Moshe seems to be a bit frozen? Yeah, I think he is a bit frozen. I think it may be me who's a little frozen. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were dumbstruck by my answer. <laughs> uh, right, coming back, I mean, it's, 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 it's data at speed, but I'm in one of the world's fastest data um, um, internet places, but I still struggle with bandwidth, right? Um, uh, coming to you, Hoy, uh, you know, one of the things that when Komal was also talking about, I, I was reminded of was when uh, Goldman Sachs actually a couple of years ago came up with this uh, algorithm and AI that can help their uh, analyst um, send out the program for uh, uh, helping their IPO filings, right? So it goes to the clients, the clients just 
fill in all the details and it's automatically fills in. One of the things that Goldman said there was that we're not replacing our analyst. It's helping them now, uh, ups, you know, do more higher value tasks, right? Uh, and given the, the story we had a few months ago with regards to the 120 hours or 100 hours uh, work that the analysts need to do, it's probably very useful for, for them, right? Uh, so how do you see this, right? What are the high value tasks? Are we going to gravitate towards a high value task, similar type of workforce, or are we going to see an impact on, especially when it comes to financial services, a reduction? of workforce yeah so i think Koma has a has a message which is a message of you know i guess the optimism and hope you know for ai and here i would be slightly different and not that i'm not an optimist i am an entrepreneur so you know always no optimist but the reality is that you know we've been very very involved with those discussions with a lot of organizations around the world and people and the reality is that there's a huge risk today of digital divide of the have and have nots, of the people who understand and those who won't. You know, people in the room here today, I'm sure, you know, will love AI and will be able to leverage this and will be doing amazing things. And of course, you now we're seeing the growth of the technology companies and digital companies and those who understand will do amazingly well. The reality is that there's a lot of people who are very, 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 very far from that and will be left behind. And we see that you know, on a daily basis. The first reason is that a lot of people, as you said, are very afraid of AI. You know, they've been doing their jobs for the last 20 years. You're telling them you're going to have to do something different. You're going to have to use this you know, crazy machine. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They've been doing the same thing. Why would they want to change? Uh, the second thing is that uh, you're talking about organizations which are helping to train. Most of organizations are not doing it at all. I give you a very, very simple number. Any random bank or standard bank, let's not call that random bank, any you know, average size banks would spend billions of dollars on that technology. But do you know how much they spend on upskilling the employees, for example, for AI, for data, for speaking digital? They would spend 1% of this, not even 1% of this. So most of that is not happening you know, at all. And so what we're seeing is that we're seeing those people who understand technology, who are flown with technology, who are you know, getting amazing jobs, who are growing their business, who are seeing opportunities. But a lot of people will not have a job, will not be able to speak you know, this language. Uh, and so I think you know, it's not a problem just of you know, uh, companies. It's a problem of society in general. And uh, you know, all the issues that we saw of the you know, inequality over the last you know, decade, we're going to see more and more of this because of technology. So I think this theme of a digital divide is really, really important and it needs to be addressed. Uh, so I know it's very, very big picture, but uh, what I'm saying is that in general, you know, AI you know, will lead you know, to much bigger businesses, to much you know, bigger growth you know, in general. You know, but I think that in general, you know, that, that could mean a bigger uh, economic growth, but there are a lot of people, if we don't do anything, you know, who will be left behind because it's something different. No, you can't just uh, you know sit and read you no know, uh, I know uh, a blog and learn about AI. You know it needs not to be properly done. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think interesting. Just one point to what you know. Oh, I made a great, great point over there, and you know, a, and obviously you know fair point that uh, me, Kopal, we all from AI companies, so we're not going to run around saying oh we're going to take away people's job, right? It, it's it's it's. We like to say that it's not going to, but you know, one interesting thing though that we've seen is when we did the research back, right? Uh, you know, if you see the 1970s, 1980s, you know, at that time the ATM had just come, and you know, similar conversations. I'm pretty sure there was a panel like this that was discussing, oh, is ATM going to destroy, uh, you know, the branch, the people in the branch, right? All the jobs are going to go because. Uh, finally, the biggest job of a bank teller at that time is to be to take cash, give cash. That was the only thing that they did. And uh, the ATM did come, it, it revolutionized and changed everything for everyone. Right? Nobody ever now, I don't remember the last time I went to a physical person to actually take out cash uh, at a bank. Uh, their role changed. Uh, some weren't able to adapt to the change. A lot of them became, the role became that of, you know, okay, being able to handle people, maintain relationships, upsell product, things like that. So, uh, you know, there were some who couldn't adapt. There were some who did did adapt. But in general, if you look at the number of people needed in branches and the number of branches across the world massively went up. So jobs in branches actually went up by 20 percent. Yes, the role role changed. So it's interesting to think about. I, I feel AI would be similar to what what the ATM example is. Yeah. 
No, it, it's really interesting because, you know, it requires redesigning the jobs as well, right? You cannot have the same old job description, which, you know, which, which complements the AI. So I think, you know, it's not just the evolution of the skill force, but it's also the evolution of organizations to redesign the jobs, to redesign the uh, workforce that will be needed. And then, uh, you know, like we mentioned that we need to then take the responsibility to bridge this di digital divide, not just the organizations, but also the go government institutions. Perhaps to, to add on Abhinav's point, uh, for the example of the ATM, uh, I, I think you're totally right yeah. that you know, a lot of those people could move into other jobs and there's a question of transferable skills. And what are the transferable skills? So if you basically you know, are giving them your customer facing, then you can move into another job, which is customer facing, not exactly the same thing. Now I think there's a question of all the jobs, which are not blue collar jobs, which are really the white collar jobs that you know, we're you know, all doing. And what are the transferable skills when what you used to do was really not, let's call that you no know, digitally advanced. And now, you know, what are, you know, how can you use you know, those skills for other things? And I think the challenge today is that for a lot of people, they need to upskill. And so this is you know, a totally different question, which is you know, how do you get you know, all of those people to get new skills, which is always hard, of course, you know, when you're not a student. Uh, uh, well, you, you bring a very important point there, right? Upskilling is very, very important in, in the modern world, because unlike probably in the, you know, if you look at the industrial revolution one, two, and three, you typically had a growing population, right? So you could retrain them and economies were growing. So you could Trans, you know, transfer the skills. But now what we're talking about are, in some cases, technology itself are evolving so quickly. What was uh, dominant five, 10 years ago may no longer be in use. And even if you talk about coders and programming languages, right? Um, I'm an ex-trader. When I was trading, algos were dominating 40% of the market and they were, you know, I was one of the point and click uh, kind of a trader. And Few years later, a majority of uh, banks, if they're hiring, they need uh, the uh, traders to know Python and know coding and you know at least R, etc. Right. So that has evolved. How are you seeing in your interaction with some of the, the large institutions and otherwise? How are companies looking to upskill their talent force? Because one element that most people forget is the cost of recruitment and you know retaining the talent as well as hiring talent is quite expensive when somebody joins you if they're not the right match you have spent three to six months and a lot of money on getting that one person so uh what do you think are uh, you know firms doing to upskill their uh, representative you know their existing talent force yeah so, so i think that's very unequal depending on firms you have some firms which are extremely active you know, in this space uh, for example, you know, some of the Singaporean firms are extremely active because uh, MAS, the regulator, you know, really pushes them to upskill their employees. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the first step of upskilling usually is uh, uh, really, let's call that at the awareness level. Just you know, uh, making sure that people have the right you know, vocabulary, understand what it is, and removing, you know, as you said, Kamal, you know, this fear factor, uh, which is that people usually fear what they don't understand. Uh, so really you know, getting them you know, to understand. And after that, uh, it, it depends on, uh, on the programs, but we see a lot of different programs. What we see is that usually you have, let's call that not the non-technical people. The first objective is for them to be able to have a conversation with technical people. So to understand you know, the main concepts of, you know, I know what is machine learning, supervised learning. So really the, 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 uh, the main vocabularies and concepts. So we see a lot of those kind of programs, you know, which can be done quite at scale, I would say, because it's really around the knowledge and getting the foundation knowledge. Uh, whereas on the technical side, it's almost the uh, opposite. It's you know, getting them to understand basically you know, why they're using the technology you know, for real use cases you know, in, uh, in financial services. And, uh, and I think that uh, most of the programs are really around you know, the bridge, you know, bridging basically you know, all those different you know, silos and getting them to understand how they can use and leverage you know, technology. So that's some of the you know programs that we see at scale in the sense of you know, uh, tens of thousands of people you know, being trained you know, for uh, for those kind of things and after that you know, as you mentioned you know, depending on the sectors and departments you can go you know, much much deeper for i know how to uh, use you know, algo trading for example with you know, whatever uh, methodologies 
Thank you. Um, Avinav, I'm just going to come back to you on this. One of the things we haven't spoken much about is COVID, right? And the impact thereof on uh, companies. Now, when you are looking at your clients, are you seeing them having significantly increased their interest in automating uh, processes because of COVID, right? And using you more. And also on the other side, are you seeing that the professionals on, on their teams understand what you're doing much better from a uh, you know just applications perspective, forgetting about the base technology side. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's been a massive transformation during COVID. I think uh, you know with any large bank insurer, change is always hard. And even for us, like we're we're not a very, very like we're a young you know technology company, but even for us, change is hard, right? And you know, a lot of them had these digital programs. A lot of them had programs where, you know, things were going online or, you know, more accessible accessibility of information, things were moving to the cloud, uh, but it was very slow. And, you know, getting someone to sign off on something was, uh, it was a journey, you know, six months, a year, sometimes two years. And, you know, COVID fast track that, right? To like seven days, three days, people were like, yes, okay, everything approved, just do it. So it was definitely helpful. I think a lot of transformation happened, you know, fairly quickly in a, in a very short span of time. I think, you know, a lot of lot of us joke that the best, uh, the CTO and the chief transformation officer for most of these organizations today is COVID. Right? It, it really it really shook up people and made them uh, made them more, less averse to change. So it has been it has been a massive change, and they're all investing a lot in this space. So it's it's good to see they're investing in AI there. They're really, you know, teaching everyone on AI and on newer technologies and making that as a differentiator. I agree with Hai that, you know, we've seen in a lot of organizations, they, they talk about upskilling, but there's a lot of them that are doing nothing about it, right? It, it's, it's more on paper that you're upskilling on the ground. <laughs> there's not that much upskilling happening. So it's something that needs to be solved. But yeah, that, that's what we're seeing with COVID. Thank you. Uh, Chapman, coming to you, right? One of the things that is a pillar for talent is the universities and schools to a certain extent as well. If we, we start looking at that process, um, what should universities be doing to you know, produce that quality talent? You know, usually there is a lag of five to 10 years before you have enough talent pool uh, coming up because programs, you know, school programs or uh, university programs take time. So how are you seeing that evolve? Are we seeing universities move in the right direction, not just in Hong Kong, but across Asia as such? Yes, I think um, recently, actually, the um, universities uh, in Hong Kong or Asia actually did some survey uh, with the fintech companies together because they want to understand actually what kind of the talents are uh, that uh, the fintech company want to acquire. And actually, it's quite interesting. The survey indicates that the company are more interested in the um, collaboration capability or the people capability instead of the technology capability because um, they think that the tech Technology actually is changing fast and changing rapidly, and um, for the university, um, for a student uh, who study a course is just to build the foundation knowledge, actually is not enough uh, for a workplace. So therefore, um, the campus uh, actually is trying to engage with the companies to uh, outsource some projects to the students. Actually, is not talking about um two months in term. It's not something like that. It could be a um, 12 months project and then uh, to outsource the student uh, who can take it in the gap year for a placement program so that uh, they have can have a longer time to expose the worst pace to understand what do they need actually it's not only about the coding skill or the system knowledge actually sometimes it's just about how do they communicate in the workplace or even just master some um, daily work tools, for example, because of office or issue is something because no one will teach you in the campus. So I think uh, these are the things that uh, some university are already working to set up some uh, longer term uh, placement program with, between the fintech companies and the students. And apart from that, actually, they also um, try to uh, organize some of the uh, academic and the industrial collaboration events and try to bring everyone together and to learn to each other. So I think uh, these are the things that uh, they are doing and try to establish uh, the fintech ecosystem at the early stage. 
Thanks, Chapman. Komal, coming to you on this, right? Uh, quite often, when we look at artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, some of these are very, they are hard skills in, 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 in a lot of senses rather than soft skills in, 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 in that uh, essence. So what would you expect as a, as a founder, as a senior uh, hire in your company when the talent is coming in? What do you want the universities to be um, providing in terms of skill sets uh, for these students? It's it's really uh, uh, interesting to uh, take a look at uh, um, a what kind of skills we we would be looking at when we are hiring, and b what can be done to address the the skill set need uh, in the short term as well as in the long term. So now going back to the first point. So in terms of you know uh, being a conversational AI company, of course, when we when we are hiring professionals, we are you know looking for uh, people with AI experience, data scientists, NLP analysts, and you know everything that's related to AI and machine learning. Uh, um, and of course, uh, in in terms of what universities and uh, the education system do. Uh, in the short term, I think they, there has to be an increase in the number of AI related courses, which I can see it evident from, uh, you know, so many courses cropping up uh, for re related to AI machine learning, like Oxford is doing that strategy, even, even in business uh, schools, such as uh, LBS, we are having some courses related to, uh, to AI. And uh, so, so in order to fill the short term gap, there is a need for more data scientists, uh, people who are focusing more on research, analytics, NLP processing, uh, and the university should be able to provide with those courses to be able to uh, equip the uh, uh, employees or equip uh, the students with, with those kind of skill set. But in the long term, I think we need to take a long term view as well so that we can prepare our future generation as well to be ready for this rise in the demand of AI and new skill set. And I guess, you know, this is where um, the schools should be focusing more on the STEM education. We can see in the primary school, you know, uh, that there is a focus on students learning uh, STEM, science, technology, uh, um, and 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 uh, uh, educational uh, media and uh, other stuff. Um, and not only this, like I'll, I'll go back to the point that it's not just the responsibility of the education institutions, but it is the responsibility of the government institutions as well to be able to create uh, or incentivize such uh, initiatives, not only through the educational institutes, but also uh, by training the workforce uh, who could be ready to, uh, you know, take on these kind of uh, new digital skills and also to incentivize the uh, organizations so that they are able to spend more on their R&D and, you know, training of the uh, of their workforce. Thanks, Khoi. I'm going to come back to you uh, with regards to this conversation in, in terms of one, what should universities be doing more? You know, both of us are actively involved with the University of Hong Kong's uh, online fintech mood, uh, MOOC, right? Sorry, that's done quite well. CFTC is uh, involved with the multiple universities uh, globally. So where are you seeing in terms of, I'm combining what was going to be the next question as well, like where are we seeing the biggest talent gap and what are universities doing to fill that up and companies like yourselves? Uh, so, so in terms of, uh, and I fully agree with you know, what Chapman and Koma said, uh, in terms of what is important today, uh, we're currently doing a research on the jobs of the largest uh, 150 fintech companies in the world. Uh, so we're finishing it at the moment. And looking at those jobs, what are they hiring for? And what is important in terms of requirements? Hard skills, soft skills. I would put digital skills also as part of hard skills, but as a separate one mindset and you know as you come said for example industry experience mm -hmm. uh, but what is really really interesting is that they don't hire a lot of students they hire a lot of you no know, mid-level or more and one of the reasons is that you no know, students don't have the applicable uh, you know skills that they that they need and that's why you know they're looking for people you know who who already have you know, those skills so that's of course you know, one of the big you know issues of universities that today universities are not really training you know, the people who can immediately to be useful in a fintech startup. Uh, so I think no, that's one. In terms of what universities really need to focus on, uh, I think definitely you know, on the hard skills, you know, people who know more about machine learning and LP, et cetera, yes. But I think the, the foundation is not there. 
And I think the foundation, which we know very well because we have a lot of interns today, for example, we have you know, at these moments, we have you know, 15 interns you know, with us from all the best universities you know, in the world, you know, uh, in Brown College and UCL and you know, best universities. For each single one of them, there's a huge, huge, huge gap on digital skills. And uh, what are the digital skills? That will seem very, very basic, but you know, if you have children, you know, I think it's really important. PowerPoints, Excel, doing a WordPress uh, website. This is not being taught anywhere. It you know, falls into the gap you know, somewhere, but for us, you know, it is an issue, for example, as an employer. So we have to train people on those very, very basic digital skills. So I think uh, having you know, people who are familiar with those digital skills is really you not know, the foundation level. And on top of that, you can add but I think the issue of big universities is that perhaps they're a bit too focused on you know, some of those you know, industry you know, expertise, you know, corporate finance, et cetera, and they forget a bit the foundation for today's world, which is just pure digital skills. Yeah, but very, very aptly put. And when you talk about corporate finance investment, uh, it involves a lot of corporate finance. So Chapin, I'm going to come to you on this. Uh, in terms of the, you know, there is one element of existing talent shortage or, you know, lack for existing models and uh, technology applications. And then there is the question of what lies in the future, right? Uh, and what we are seeing is in the buy side and, you know, in the investor management world, they move much slower than potentially some of the other parts of the industry. So from, uh, from an Investco perspective, from your own personal team perspective what would what do you anticipate to be the gaps uh, in the coming days for uh, in the investment management and the trading world well i think uh, actually we are also facing the challenge to acquire the um young talents especially i think from the young generation for the data science or uh, or for the uh, professional because um the um the talent actually they may have they may have the taste to join a well-established company. And because of uh, the things that are compared with those fintech companies, uh, we may be less flexible, um, may have uh, more rules or policies to follow. So uh, I think right now, uh, the, um, for example, the financial service companies may not be their first choice after graduate. So I think it is something actually we are compete, uh, we're competing together with those uh, fintech companies to acquire the white right talents. So uh, my suggestion is we try to uh, do some more things uh, to share the commission to the staff and try to um, engage them uh, more closely and then to less them we have the opportunity to both together. Thank you on that. Abhinav, I'm going to come to you. Uh, Chapman is saying the established companies are uh, having a little difficulty in showing that they're sexy, even though, you know, the big money can be sexy. Uh, on the other side, you are a trendy, hot uh, fintech startup. What are your challenges and where do you see as the biggest talent gap for companies like yours? Yeah, I think... Uh... Sorry. Yeah, I think you know, the biggest talent, you know, the biggest gap for us is, yeah, we, we do get a lot of people who apply and are excited by the work that Fluid AI does and companies like us do in general. I think, uh, you know, the challenge is like the big guys, you know, they have like massive training capabilities. I think Hawaii was mentioning this as well, right? There is a gap and they're able, they have like, you know, training facilities, they have massive, like, you know, they, they spend three months training their folks. I think for us, when we hire, we typically want people to kind of, get in the weeds much quicker. And, and I think that's where the gap really exists. And I think one thing I've realized is that, you know, you know, every corporate says this, oh, the, the education system is not trained and in, in India and, you know, in our Asian, in, in Indian economy, even more so than I think some of the others, but we often say, oh, they're not training, training folks, you know, enough, and we need to get them to, you know, train the students better. But I think the responsibility for the for the education institutes the way we see it should be just to make these people great learners, um, you know, teach them how to learn well, and so that when they come into systems like ours, you know, we're able to just tell them, you know, these are the skills you need to learn, and they can figure it out, you know, or they can learn quickly. So I think that's that's what we're aiming for. But that's definitely, if you ask from a gap perspective, it's it's about just skilling, upskilling. Uh, and training the folks because sometimes they do have the raw skill and the raw talent, but they don't have, you know, the the end skills that are needed to just get them to hit the ground running. Um, as we come towards the end of the panel, I would like a you know sharp, quick response from each of you for the meat of the sandwich, right? So you have 
the senior managers, et cetera, who are deciding which way the companies go. And then you have the fresh talent coming from universities. But a majority of us, you know, who work for 15, 20 years uh, have developed sort of skill sets. Some of these are hard, hardwired in us and some of them need to be rewired, right? So if you were addressing that middle layer, which is the, the juicy, the creamy, the best part of the of the sandwich, uh, the talent sandwich, what would you advocate? And uh, we, are, we are short on time. So take about 30 seconds in terms of what should be the two things you would expect or advocate that they should do. So let's start with Komal. Yeah, uh, I think in terms of uh, advocate, uh, we should uh, first of all, equip ourselves, train ourselves and prepare for the future and also take all the initiatives to ensure that our workforce is trained and prepared uh, for the future demands that are coming through. Thank you, Komal. Uh, Chapman? Well, I could say one, just one key point is that no matter you are junior or senior, actually it's about the self-learning capability. Otherwise, uh, you will be fade out from this uh, fast growing industry. Great. Abhinav? Yeah, I think I agree with Chapman. Uh, you know, the ability to learn, I think uh, that's going to be key. Uh, people that have a better ability to learn are going to go far ahead in the organization. And I think the other thing for talent, I'd say the second one would probably be adaptability, right? Uh, taking the skills that you have and adapting them for the relevant situation uh, that you're put in or the relevant industry that you join, because you might be, you know, changing things and moving things very often. So adaptability and ability to learn. Great. Uh, Hui? Yeah, perhaps no. If I talk about impact first, uh, I, I think you know, we'll have to target you know, people in position of responsibilities and influence. People at the level of government, people at the level of head of organizations, uh, there's something that they should do and they must do. And uh, if we look at the potential of AI, it's amazing. Uh, it can change the world. It will change the world. Uh, and I think you know, for all of us, we have the ability to transform. Uh, for all of us, we have the ability to upskill. So I don't think there's any issues for anyone to do it. The biggest challenge we're all facing is procrastination, is a complacency. Uh, so I think, you know, let's, you know, for all of us, uh, let's just make sure that, you know, we're getting you know, on board the train and start the journey. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're going to be left behind. Thanks. I, I, my final word on this is going to be two initiatives that I'm, you know, very close to and also passionate about. One is make use of uh, existing, uh, you know, initiatives which may not be very expensive or free. You know, the University of Hong Kong's uh, fintech MOOC is a classic example which has various elements to it and it's available online, can be done, and has a host of different uh, experts. And of course, uh, you know, who is not mentioned, it has been very modest throughout the panel. Uh, um, CFT has been doing some tremendous work in the space for the last several years. Uh, we as FinStep Asia are partners with them on a variety of initiatives, especially the new one called Think. So look them up and, you know, uh, they'll be they'll be great for you to add more arsenal to your upgrade. So uh, I'll now take this opportunity to thank all of you for having joined us and shared your wonderful insights with our audience. I'm sure there's, there's a lot of learning that everybody's had uh, across uh, the base and uh, hopefully we can see more traction in AI talent in the coming days. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today.